I've mentioned it time and time again over the years, but Mega Man is my favorite video game series of all time. It's pretty well known by now that Sonic 2 is my favorite video game, but when it comes to overall favorite game franchise, Mega Man, specifically classic, takes the entire cake and then some. Now, I've made some Mega Man videos here and there on different things like weird entries in the series and bootlegs, but with the exception of a video I made 10,000 years ago on Mega Man 7, I've never really legitimately covered the series. Today, I aim to rectify that. So grab yourself a little snacky and some soda pop, Actually, don't do that. Soda's real bad for you. Go grab some water, and let's take a look at every mainline entry in the Mega Man Classic series. But first, before we crack into all that, I want to take a minute to talk about this video's sponsor, Magic Spoon. If you've been paying attention, you may have noticed that occasionally, including in the intro to this video, I've made little quips and comments here and there on this channel about nutrition, but I've never really gone in depth with how I feel about it. I, like many of you, often don't eat quite as well as I should, but I know enough to know what I should and shouldn't be eating, and I try to be as conscientious as I can, which includes avoiding sugar and carbs if it can be helped. That kind of throws the chances of me indulging in a bowl of delicious breakfast cereal out the window, as I just really can't justify starting my morning off with with a sugar bomb. Magic Spoon changes all of that and fixes my problem, not only giving me an actual healthy alternative option to the typical breakfast cereal I've missed so dearly for the morning, but really any time of the day. Magic Spoon cereals have zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four to five net grams of carbs per serving. Only 140 calories in each serving. They're also keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free. Their variety pack comes with four delicious flavors. Of course, you got your cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. They have a bunch more flavors available as well, and you can customize your own pack with whatever flavors you like. Personally, I can't get enough of the cocoa flavor. It's sweet, but has that slight bitter cocoa kick that's usually lacking in other brands. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for whatever reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So if you're like me and love breakfast cereal, but can't justify eating the sugary, grainy stuff you loved as a kid, click the link below to grab a variety pack and try it today. And use the promo code Gilly at checkout to not only get $5 off any order, but help my channel out in the process. Or go to magicspoon.com slash Gilly. Okay, so as you'd probably expect, I'm gonna go in order of release here. If I were talking about the many different spin-offs and such, it would get a bit more confusing, and because of that, and the fact that doing every single facet of the classic series would make this video way too long, today, I'm just gonna be covering the main numbered entries and anything else that significantly contributes to the mainline games. So for the most part, laying these out is pretty straightforward. In the future, I will cover everything else, but for today, we're talking about the main games. With that out of the way, let's get on with the video. Mega Man. The first game in the entire franchise. Prior to this game's release in 1987, Capcom was primarily an arcade developer. With the creation of Mega Man, Capcom was trying to make a game and mascot that were specifically targeted at the console market. Instead of being a home console port of an arcade game, Mega Man, or Rock Man as he was initially named in Japan, would be built from the ground up for the NES. As the story goes, not only did they change Rockman's name to Mega Man for the US market, but they also decided to change the charming Japanese box art to, uh, this. By now, most everybody knows this infamous illustration. It's, it's ridiculous. So, so ridiculous, in fact, and so notable for that ridiculousness that it is forever remembered, with Capcom themselves even featuring it as its own character in Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Now, I think it's been memed so much at this point that the humor has all been sucked dry from it, but honestly, if you just sit down, forget everything else, and really just take a look at it for what it is, Christ, this was, this was really bad. So the story of Mega Man 1 is pretty simple and straightforward. The classic series in general doesn't ever really get too involved story-wise, and they're all pretty straightforward. But Mega Man 1 sets the groundwork with its initial introduction to the characters and premise of the series. Dr. Thomas Light and Dr. Albert Wiley are colleagues in robotics. Dr. Light creates worker robots that perform specific functions to aid humanity, along with two robotic lab assistants, Rock and his sister, Roll. One day, Wiley decides he's gonna be a big jealous prick and in an effort to take over the world, reprograms Dr. Light's various worker robots, which now under his control will help him in his plan for world domination. Rock, having a strong sense of justice, volunteers himself to be converted into a fighting robot, referred to now as Mega Man, to stop the six robot masters and take Wily down. But not put Wily down, because robots can't kill humans. Because if they could, we would have only ever had one game. And that's pretty much the reason that the series keeps going on 
uh, canonically anyway. Now, if you were a kid at the time this game came out, you'd have had no idea this was the story, at least in America. None of the story is explained in game, and the manual we got over here had some ridiculous story about a place called Monstropolis. It's this weird bastardized version of what the story actually was. It's weird because it's not even like they came up with an original story because they had no context. It's more like they just took the actual story and rewrote a bootleg version of it. Now the game itself, for the most part, and this is something you'll see a lot as we move on, is set up like everything will be going forward in the series, only you can tell this was game number one. You can tell the series skeleton is there, but Mega Man 1 is definitely more rough around the edges. They actually pretty quickly refine the series into what it would become soon after the groundwork set by the first game. Like, in the entire series going forward, every game has eight Robot Masters, but in Mega Man 1, there are only six. Not to mention, they decided to add a score to this game, and one of the main enemy drops in Mega Man 1 is points. I don't think I need to elaborate on why the point system was dropped. I guess home console gaming was still being pretty influenced by what was going on in the arcade, so sometimes companies threw in random stuff that was standard fare in arcade games, but didn't really make much sense outside of that. Mega Man 1 is like a rough outline. A sketch, if you will. Most of the main elements of what the Mega Man franchise would become are here, but just in a pretty rough form. Enemy placement is kind of cheap. The music, in my opinion, isn't as good. Once again, there are only six Robot Masters, and overall, the game just isn't quite as fun as the series would soon become. It isn't a bad game by any stretch of the imagination, especially on the NES and for the time it came out. But if you're used to the titles that came out after it, Mega Man 1 is rough. Even the controls are quite a bit worse. I know it's hard to convey through footage, but Mega Man is just very slippery. When you try to stop short when running, Mega Man slides on the ground like 500 pixels in the direction you were going. It almost feels like slight ice physics. You can mitigate this by jumping though, so I often find myself jumping in Mega Man 1 way more often than usual to compensate. Of course, it's impossible to talk about Mega Man 1 without mentioning the infamous pause glitch. So unlike every other Mega Man game, Mega Man 1 can be paused in two ways. The standard way that you would in the rest of the series by pressing start to bring up the menu, or the select button, which instead just freezes the screen, more typical to what a pause button would do in games back then. Problem is, or rather I should say, fortunately, this adds a little weirdness into the mix. Now this trick can be done with any weapon, but it's most useful and effective with Electman's Thunderbeam, as it has a much larger hitbox that travels. Pausing and unpausing rapidly causes the hitbox to stay active after it connects, allowing you to get multiple hits in one shot, oftentimes allowing you to take down some Mega Man 1's notoriously hardest bosses in one fell swoop. Is it cheating? I don't know, maybe, but... Have I already beaten the Yellow Devil boss fight fair and square the right way and am completely unwilling to not use this exploit every time I play Mega Man 1 now? Bet your ass I'm spamming that pause button. Mm-hmm, that's right. Anyway, that's about all that's notable for Mega Man 1. I'd never say it's a bad game, but I will say it's one of the most, if not the most, rough game in the Mega Man Classic series. I will go on record saying there doesn't exist a bad Mega Man Classic game, but Mega Man 1 was absolutely the pilot episode of the series, and it does show. Mega Man 2's reputation precedes itself. Known by many an old gamer who never managed to move past the 80s as the best one, Mega Man 2 is a much better example of what this series has to offer. Lots of refinements were made here, some subtle, others more apparent, but it overall yielded a way, way more polished product. So as the story goes, Mega Man 1 didn't sell all that well. Despite the series still going on to this day, with not only the original series itself, but countless spin-offs, Mega Man 1 didn't do all that good sales-wise. Apparently though, it did well enough for Capcom to allow the team to make a sequel, as the team was still passionate about it and believed in what they created. That passion ended up needing to be the main driving force though, because Capcom greenlit the game under one really big condition. It needed to be completed on the team's own time, not Capcom's. They were determined though, and on their free time, not spent working on other Capcom titles, Mega Man 2 was finished in a matter of months. Now the box art this time around was an improvement, but I'm using the word improvement very loosely here. This is still ridiculous and a far cry from the anime chibi art style being used overseas. Admittedly, Mega Man wasn't the only series that had its artwork quote unquote westernized. Far from it, but I really don't know why the industry thought American kids didn't like cute stuff and everything had to be gritty and cool, often resulting in the exact opposite. It's like they really needed to emphasize the fact that his name is Mega Man, so they just 
through a spandex wearing gun wielding man on the cover. And I'm not even going to get into the European box art. It's actually a step backwards from the European Mega Man 1 art, but at the very least it got the whole robot thing right. Unlike the uh, Dollar Tree Power Ranger on the US box. This time around we have a little bit more going on for the intro and title screen. While the first game just had a boring logo on a black background, at least in the US, Mega Man 2 opens up with a little story exposition and a short cutscene of sorts. Text at the bottom of the screen briefly explaining that Dr. Wily, after being defeated in the first game, created eight robot masters of his own to counter Mega Man. As the camera pans up to Mega Man standing atop a building, the title screen music then kicks in, and we have one of the most iconic intros and title screens in all of gaming. Now, in America, we got two difficulties, normal and difficult. But this was a lie, as difficult was actually how the game originally was in Japan. So in all actuality, the North American release should have said normal and easy mode. On America's normal mode, which is easy, your regular arm cannon does more damage and enemy drop rates for helpful items is increased. In my opinion, Mega Man 2 isn't really a very difficult game to begin with. It's much, much easier than the first game, but I guess it's a good option for younger kids or people unfamiliar with the series. Now, the level design in Mega Man 2 is leagues better than the first game. In fact, I think it's one of the main reasons I don't really have that much fun with Mega Man 1. The level design is just kind of bland with not much to offer. It's all the difficulty with far less of the fun obstacle course based level design. The controls are very, very similar to the first game. Mega Man is still a little bit slippery, but I'm almost certain refinements were made here. Mega Man's controls from game to game do get subtly changed, so it's often not exactly a night and day difference that's immediately obvious, but I do feel more in control here. I have less of a problem with Mega Man's slipperiness, and overall Mega Man just feels a lot less heavy and more quick and nimble. I don't feel like I'm fighting the controls quite as much as in the first game. The boss weapons of the first game I didn't really touch on because, in truth, they aren't all that interesting or fun to use, and some can only be used situationally. Mega Man 2's boss power-ups, on the other hand, for the most part, are all pretty fun and effective. Now, truth be told, I'm honestly not that guy. I'm not the person who uses boss power-ups very much. I play through pretty much every single Mega Man game using the arm cannon, saving boss powers only for bosses, or in the very few specific situations where I absolutely need to use them. But Mega Man 2 is the one game in the series where I, like most everyone else, spams one special weapon. As I said, most of the weapons are good, but one weapon trumps them all in almost every situation. Metal Man's Metal Blade. You can shoot it in eight directions, it does a lot of damage, and you can fire a lot of shots at once, unlike your arm cannon, which can only have three shots on the screen at one time. And using it also barely consumes its own energy bar. By the time you use a substantial amount of weapon energy, you've probably already gotten a weapon energy drop to fill it back up. It's absolutely OP. I wouldn't say it's broken, but it definitely does feel a little unbalanced and makes you not really want to use anything else. Now, the music is undoubtedly a huge improvement and much more resembles what you'll hear in the rest of the NES Mega Man games. The backgrounds and overall visuals are also a huge improvement. Mega Man 2 is just one of those sequels that really just looked at what the first game did, looked at what it did wrong, and used that to make a successor that leapfrogs it in every possible way, but without losing sight of the original groundwork set by the first game. It actually reminds me a lot of Sonic 1 and Sonic 2 in that regard. Don't get me wrong, there's still some bullshit here and there, like Quick Man Stage, who Decades later, I still managed to get a game over on, and one of the wily bosses which baits you and tries to trick you into using your weapon energy when you only have a fixed amount of shots with a full energy bar and actually need all of it to defeat the boss to the point where you can't even afford to miss a shot and doing so will render the boss unbeatable. Still though, Mega Man 2 is one of the most iconic video games of all time. It was a huge improvement on the groundwork set by the first game and was an absolute perfect sequel. Hey, real quick, I know you're tired of hearing this, but if you happen to like what you're watching, consider subscribing. It really does make a huge impact on this channel's success, especially when I'm doing these like really long videos lately. So if you like what I'm doing and you want to support, maybe tap that subscribe button. Also, I almost never plug it except for at the very end of videos, but I also have a Patreon, which really helps with these bigger projects as I have less of a safety net uploading one big video as opposed to multiple little ones. So if you want to throw me something, I'd really appreciate it. The link will be in the description. Anyway, that's it. Back to the video. So with Mega Man 2, Capcom finally had a hit on their hands, solidifying Mega Man as a profitable series worth continuing. Naturally, they would follow up on that success, but not by taking their time and crafting a well-polished game, but rather rushing something out the door as quickly as possible to ride the money train. 
For all intents and purposes, Mega Man 3 isn't a bad game, not in the slightest. It is, however, a rushed, flawed, and unfinished game, and that's not coming from my mouth either. The game literally was not finished before Capcom forced the team to push it out the door as quickly as possible, with quite a few bugs, graphical issues, and a weird lack of polish that was present in the previous game. Like the title screen, which despite having one of the best title screen tracks in the series, is pretty barren, unlike the game before it and nearly all the games after, with nothing more than the logo for the game on the screen. Despite all of this, although it's rough around the edges and does have quite a bit of padding, which I will get to, Mega Man 3 did end up being a good game, all things considered. It may not necessarily hit some of the highs the second game did, but it's still a big improvement in terms of progressing the series, with tighter controls, the introduction of the slide mechanic, which would become a series staple, overall more creative and colorful visuals, and of course, great music. Mega Man 3 is a really good game, despite it being rushed. And speaking of rush, R Rush. This was the series' first introduction to Mega Man's red robot dog, who now takes the place of the items from Mega Man 2. See, Mega Man 2 had various item power-ups you'd get after beating certain stages, which both helped you traverse the stages and, in some instances, were mandatory. In Mega Man 3, Rush takes over that job and turns into a jet, which is completely overpowered unless you fly in any direction, a useless marine vehicle, which really is only useful in, like, one or two spots in the entire game, and Rush Coil, which you start the game with automatically. It turns Rush into a springboard that Mega Man can jump on to reach higher areas. Rush isn't the only new character introduced either. Mega Man 3 would be the first game to feature Proto Man, Mega Man's brother. But this isn't actually revealed to you until the end of the game. Throughout Mega Man 3, you'll randomly run into him and need to fight him before proceeding. It's only after defeating all eight robot masters, and the four dock robots, which I'll get to in a second, that he's referred to on the main stage select screen as Breakman with the facial appearance of a sniper Joe, needing to once again be defeated before proceeding. Once again, the story isn't explained in-game, yet another step back from Mega Man 2, but the TLDR is Dr. Wily sees the error of his ways, apparently, and partners up with Dr. Light to create a giant peacekeeping robot named Gamma. To complete Gamma, though, eight energy elements are needed to power it. Eight robot masters were created by Wily and Light to mine for set elements across various uncharted planets. For some strange reason I'm sure nobody can assume, the robots go rogue, so now it's up to Mega Man to stop them. Yeah, sp uh, spoiler, but Wily was still bad. Oh no. Also, the American box art is getting a little closer to something actually resembling Mega Man. Sort of. Apart from the weird face and awkward pecs. Anyway, you go after the eight robot masters, but this time, after defeating them, you're met with four additional robots that you need to defeat, called the Dock Robots. And this would be the padding I was talking about. See, instead of creating four brand new robots to fight, which would already have been a bit much, these are four actually eight identical robots that take on the powers of the eight robot masters from Mega Man 2. Now, you need to go through short versions of Mega Man 3 stages you've already been to, which isn't too terrible, but each of the four stages have two dock robots, one at the end of each stage like any normal robot master, which you can fail at defeating and the game places you right back at the boss door like normal, but the first dock robot of each stage is placed right in the middle, like a mini boss, only it's not a mini boss, it's a regular boss with a regular boss difficulty and no checkpoint. So basically, if you lose to the first dock robot in any of the four dock robot stages, you get sent back all the way to the beginning of the stage, which is extremely frustrating. It makes no sense why they included the end boss checkpoints, but none before the first boss of each stage. So you either need to play perfectly or eat up your precious E-Tanks. Apart from the annoying padding later on in the game, though, Mega Man 3 is, for the most part, a good time with creative level design, albeit not as memorable as in Mega Man 2, and a pretty fair difficulty for the most part anyway. It's honestly one of the easier Mega Man games overall, but just happens to have random spikes in difficulty that seem a bit out of place and probably only exist to extend the game's playtime. Once you make it to the end, it appears that Wily's been crushed and killed, which we all know isn't true, and Mega Man, also injured by falling blocks, is saved by a mysterious mysterious shadowy figure, revealed afterward by Dr. Light as Mega Man's long-lost brother and prototype to Mega Man's design, Proto Man. Although Wily was crushed in the prior cutscene, we can see him once again getting away in the game's final moment, setting us up for the inevitable continuation of the series. Apparently, Mega Man 4, for a lot of people, was one of the more forgettable games of the NES era, and I honestly, I, I don't get it. Now, for me, Mega Man 4 was the first game in the series I ever played, or 
tried to play anyway. I just kind of used to play through the stages and then die whenever I got to a robot master, rinse and repeat. I'm not sure how I landed on Mega Man 4 as the first game I would play, as I owned Mega Man 2, 3, and 4 all at the same time when I was little. The NES was on its way out, so NES games and consoles were plentiful at garage sales, and I must have got a box of NES games that had those three games, but I guess Mega Man 4's box art looked the most alluring to me, despite Mega Man's face looking like Lady Elaine Fairchild from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Despite being absolute dog sh terrible at the game, which makes sense as I was probably like five or six years old, I absolutely love the aesthetic of the game. The music is some of my favorite in the entire franchise. The art direction and visuals are a big step up from the previous games, and the intro cutscene is absolutely absolutely iconic, at least to me. It tells a flashback recap of Rock's transformation into Mega Man, and then picks the story up in present day, where after the previous three defeats of Dr. Wily, eight new robot masters have popped up. The creations of a new villain, Dr. Kosak, 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 I don't know. I keep hearing people pronounce his name differently. He's supposed to be Russian. I've always called him Dr. Kozak, so we're calling him Dr. Kozak. He's a mysterious Russian scientist, if you couldn't tell, by his f***ing castle. One of the reasons I'm surprised that this game is written off or forgotten by a lot of people is because this game introduced the new Mega Buster for the first time, the Charge Shot, an absolute staple of the series as a whole carried over even into the spin-offs of the Mega Man Classic series. Whenever I go back and play Mega Man 1 through 3, it's still weird to me to not have the charged buster shot available. I know some people, for whatever reason, don't like it, but I think it's as integral of a mechanic to the series as the slide, maybe even more so, and it all started with Mega Man 4. Even in Mega Man X, where the slide was replaced with the dash, they kept the charge shot. Mega Man 4 also has some of my favorite robot master designs and stages, like Skull Man and Pharaoh Man. 4 has some notably unique stage environments. This time around, not only does Mega Man have the rush abilities, but there are also additional items hidden in a couple of the stages. And honestly, the first time I found the one in Pharaoh Man stage as a kid, my brain exploded, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. See, there's a path in Pharaoh Man stage that leads you downward, and in any other spot in the series thus far, hopping over to the other side of an intended path does nothing, and I've I've tried it. Especially in Gemini Man stage from Mega Man 3, I'm sure everybody else tried that too. Here though, if you hop on Rush Coil to jump over the intended path, the screen will scroll to the right and lead you down a different path to the power-up. I think this was the first time in a video game that I was rewarded for being overly curious. Now, if you have any experience with this series, there's always a few constants that never change. Mega Man is blue. He steals his defeated opponent's powers, and the final boss is always Wily. It is always, always Wily. After defeating the eight robot masters, you make your way to Dr. Kozak's castle this time as opposed to Wily's. But after defeating the stages and bosses and fighting Dr. Kozak, it's revealed that Wily actually blackmailed Dr. Kozak by kidnapping his daughter, who ends up being saved by Proto Man. Wily gets super pissed at Proto Man, and then you need to make your way through Wily's castle. I will admit, this does feel a little like padding, and it's not the last time this series will do this, but it does seem a bit less egregious than Mega Man 3's blatant reuse of assets. I wouldn't even necessarily call it padding because it's all original content, but Mega Man 4 does feel like it overstays its welcome just a little bit. Definitely much less so than 3, though. I'm sure you aren't surprised to hear that once you defeat all three of Dr. Wily's forms, he once again gets away as his castle explodes. Mega Man then rides atop a train back home as the credits play out. I don't know, I guess I could see why people aren't super keen on this one, but really only in the context of playing one through three first. The Mega Man Classic series does stick to the same formula pretty hard, so I guess by the fourth game in the series, it may have gotten a little stale for some people, but for me anyway, having this one as a starting place, it's actually a little harder to go back to the previous games that don't have the staple mechanics present in 4. This game actually has some of my favorite stage gimmicks of the entire series, like the disappearing beam platforms in Ringman stage, or the moving platforms on arcing tracks in Brightman stage, and honestly, Dive Man stage is probably one of the only water levels I actually like, and I'm not talking about Mega Man either, I mean literally just one of the only water levels I've ever liked, period, in video games. I think Mega Man 4 deserves a lot more credit than it's often given. It's actually quite a bit more difficult in my opinion than the first three games as well, sometimes frustratingly so, but it's all still fair. If you've managed to overlook this one, I'd definitely give it a shot. It's honestly probably my favorite of the NES era, and the introduction of the charge shot alone is proof enough that this game left an impact. Mega Man 5 was never a game that held much significance to me. Don't get me wrong, it's a great game in its own right, but 
I think out of the entire six game NES run, Mega Man 5 is the most overlooked, maybe even more so than 4. Mega Man 5 is also the most expensive of the NES Mega Man games to find a physical copy for, so maybe it was overlooked at the time it came out as well. And. You know, it's not really too surprising. As high quality as all the Mega Man games are, I'd be lying to myself if I said they were all super different from each other. While they do each have their own things they bring to the table to advance the series, they mostly feel like level packs or ROM hacks of each other. On one hand, this if it ain't broke don't fix it approach allowed them to streamline production and make a lot of games with a high level of quality. It also, unfortunately, at least at the time, made the series start to feel stagnant. In hindsight, I'm glad they went with this approach just because of the sheer number of great classic Mega Man games we have available now, but at the time, it was definitely a detriment to the series' success. Now, it's actually a bit surprising that Mega Man 5 didn't leave more of an impact on me than the rest, seeing as how Proto Man is my favorite character in the whole franchise, including the spin-off series, because Mega Man 5's story is centered around Proto Man. The story and structure of 5 is very similar to Mega Man 4, with a bait-and-switch main villain and two castles to tackle. Even the beats of the story itself are similar, with 4's Dr. Kozak being blackmailed by Dr. Wily with the kidnapping of his daughter. In 5, Proto Man gets framed this time. In all actuality, Proto Man isn't really the villain, and he's instead framed by Dr. Wily with a doppelganger robot he created. So just like 4's Dr. Kozak's castle, in Mega Man 5, once the eight robot masters are defeated, you go through fake Proto Man's castle first before making your way to Wily's. In fact, I think the only original thing this game has going for it is the introduction of Beat, the robot bird, as well as your means of actually obtaining him, which I do think is a fun and challenging inclusion. The eight letters that spell out the words Mega Man 5 are scattered throughout each of the robot master stages. Eight robots, eight letters, with the exception of one that happens to be pretty well hidden, all of these letters are right out in the open and can't possibly be missed, visually anyway. It's actually collecting the letters that becomes a challenge, and some are quite easy to miss and require you to either die on purpose or come back to the stage after beating it. Many of them require some quick thinking and fast reflexes to collect first try, so on one hand it's a bit frustrating, but on the other, the fact that you can go back and collect them if you miss them means it's still pretty fair, albeit maybe a bit tedious. I don't really like when collection challenges and games can just be outright failed with no convenient way to quickly try again, but none of these are outright missable, so it's ultimately okay. Collecting all the letters unlocks Beat, a robot bird who can attack enemies for you. He has an energy meter just like your other weapons though, so you need to use him wisely, especially on the final Wily fight. Wily can totally be taken down without him, but having Beat in your arsenal makes your life 5,000 times easier. See, in the final Wily battle, he just kind of disappears and reappears around the stage, firing these energy balls at you, which aren't all that hard to dodge, but probably half the time he appears, he's too high up for you to get a hit in. Beat, however, not only can just attack him no matter where he spawns, but he also reveals his location to you while he's still invisible, making it easier to dodge his attacks, and also gives you a better chance of getting even more hits in. If you die to Wily though, Beat's energy won't refill, so you're better off just using your E-Tanks rather than risk dying and losing Beat. I never really thought too much of Mega Man 5 throughout the years, but replaying it again for this video, I think it's a bit stronger of a game than I gave it credit for. I definitely like it more than 1 in 3, it just doesn't have too many original things going for it. Besides Beat, it really doesn't do anything unique to advance the series in the ways 2, 3, and 4 did. Instead, it's just a solid Mega Man game with solid level design. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is fun and honestly doesn't leave anything to be desired. It's a culmination of everything that came before it. Unfortunately though, because of this, Mega Man 5 doesn't really have anything unique to it that stands out and makes it memorable. Still though, I think Mega Man 5 is a great entry that shouldn't be overlooked. It may not have too many things unique to it, but the level design, control, and overall fun factor is nothing to scoff at. I know I gotta sound like a broken record by now, but out of all the classic NES Mega Man games, I think 6 was probably the most overlooked, at least at the time of its release. I mean, let's be honest, I said earlier that the NES Mega Man games are, for all intents and purposes, level packs. I often don't like saying this because I do think they all bring something new and important to the table, which serve to progress the series, but... Let's face it, apart from the visuals becoming more and more intricate and more detailed in terms of the stages and backgrounds, the graphics and sprites all pretty much stay the same throughout. I mean, we didn't even get the original intended Super Mario Bros. 2 because it was too similar to the first game in its visuals and playstyle. Compare Mega Man 1 through 6 to Mario 1 through 3 and it's pretty apparent where I'm coming from here. Not to say that any of these games should be discredited, but I can definitely see how at the time, having six games come out over the course of like five or six years that all looked and played extremely similar, people started getting tired of it. Six, despite probably being the most ambitious of the NES Mega Man games, got the absolute shortest end of the stick, especially when you consider the fact that only a month later, Mega Man X would come out, and that's only in Japan. 
In America, we didn't see Mega Man 6 until Mega Man X had already been out for a couple months. Sure, a lot of people still owned the NES and didn't adopt the SNES platform yet, but to have a game like X come out around the same time, it's safe to say 6 never really got a fair shot. Mega Man 6 is probably the most interesting of the initial NES run. The visuals are noticeably more vibrant, colorful, and detailed. The controls have reached their peak in accuracy, and despite having yet another predictable story of some other evil villain taking the spotlight only to end up just being wily in disguise, the approach to this one was actually pretty unique this time around. Instead of the stages and robot masters being themed around one note simple things like water or fire, Mega Man 6's stages and bosses are based on different countries. Short version of the story is, some guy named Mr. X, who is definitely 100% not wily, is sponsoring a robot fighting tournament with combatants from all over the world. Mr. X turns out to be up to no good and reprograms the robots and now under his control, begins using them to take over the world. He claims that he's been the one controlling Dr. Wily all along, and now it's up to Mega Man and Rush to eliminate the eight new robot masters and take down Dr. Wily, I mean, Mr. X. New to Mega Man 6 is, in my opinion, the most distinct feature and something you'll probably use for the majority of your playthrough once you've obtained it, the new Rush Jet Adapter. In Mega Man 6, instead of the normal Rush power-ups that we've become familiar with, we have two new powers where instead of utilizing Rush as a transportation device or a trampoline, Rush instead merges with Mega Man himself and gives him one of two abilities. There's the power ability, which can break giant blocks and is helpful against some bosses, ultimately forgettable, or the aforementioned overpowered rush jet, which can be used to fly for a short period of time, infinitely recharges, and which, except for a few specific instances, should probably be used like 99.9% .9 of the time. It makes platforming much easier, but weirdly at the same time, makes some of the platforming actually more interesting, especially once you get good at controlling it. Apart from the two rush adapters, you can also once again collect the beat letters, and I Literally forgot to even get footage of Beat because I forgot he existed and never found a reason to use him. Six also marks the first appearance of the Energy Balancer item, a feature I wish existed in every Mega Man game up to this point. If you're unfamiliar, this is basically a little item that once obtained will automatically allocate weapon energy drops to whichever one of your weapons is currently the most depleted. Normally, if you need weapon energy, you need to first switch to whichever specific weapon you want to fill up before collecting a weapon energy drop from an enemy. I haven't mentioned this thus far, but that also means that collecting weapon energy when you have the regular Mega Buster equipped just results in nothing happening and you waste the energy drop. This is actually super tedious and annoying and breaks the flow of the game a little bit since in the classic games, you can't quick swap weapons. The energy balancer eliminates this by automatically sending that energy to whichever weapon currently needs it most. And if you happen to have a specific weapon you want to refill, you also have the option to switch to a specific weapon as well, as this only applies to drops that are collected when Mega Man has the buster equipped. It's such a simple inclusion, but it's honestly a game changer and makes the game feel noticeably more streamlined than any of the previous entries. Now, the only annoyance to me though is the fact that this game's collectibles don't always go hand in hand with the boss order, meaning sometimes you'll either need to beat a stage and come back to it later to collect an item you missed due to not having the correct power to obtain it, or you need to strong arm your way through the bosses out of order with the Mega Buster, which is obviously entirely possible, but this intentional backtracking clearly exists to pad out the game's length. Mega Man 6 isn't particularly difficult, actually I'd say it's one of, if not the easiest of the NES Mega Man games, but it's a lot of fun, and it's definitely one of the absolute best on the console. It did quite a few things differently, brought some new things to the table, and had some really good level design, and is hands down the best looking of the six games. Oh, and Mega Man finally, finally, almost looks normal on the box. This will be less of a main section and more of a mini part, but it's still part of the classic series and I'd be remiss to exclude it. In 1994, Mega Man The Wily Wars was released for the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive, the first Mega Man game to be released on a non-Nintendo console, at least in regions outside of the US. See, we never actually got a physical release of the game, though it was distributed via the Sega Channel, a subscription service for the Genesis which has been, obviously, long since defunct. For decades, we've had to rely on either emulation or reproduction cartridges of the game for the US until the game was finally included on the Sega Genesis mini console. Still stuck on a specific piece of hardware, but at the very least, we finally received an actual, tangible, purchasable release that wasn't gated behind some kind of service. Mega Man The Wily Wars is essentially a collection of the first three Mega Man games, remade as 16-bit updates for the Genesis hardware. Everything is remade from the ground up with completely new assets and music. Think like the Super Mario All-Stars of Mega Man games, only for the Genesis. 
Over the years, a lot of fans have had a love-hate relationship with the game, citing it as a cool novelty but ultimately feels too slow and controls too different from the original releases to be some kind of replacement for the original games. I feel like I'm somewhere in the middle. I don't think any of the 8-bit games can ever be replaced, but I still like the Wily Wars a lot. I personally think it controls just fine, and I honestly prefer the detailed pixel art over the comparably more archaic NES sprites. Hearing the classic OSTs being played through the Sega Genesis sound chip is also really cool, as I've always been a fan of it. Exclusive to the Wily Wars, though, is a brand new mode called Wily Tower, which is unlocked once all three Mega Man games are completed. In this mode, you travel through three brand new stages to take on three new bosses called the Genesis Unit, all based on characters from Journey to the West. After the three are defeated, you take on Wily once more. Unique to Wily Tower is that the game lets you mix and match any weapons or items from Mega Man's 1 through 3 to take on the tower, adding a ton of replayability since you can tailor your runs to your liking. Even though it's a bit of a black sheep of an entry, I really do love the Wily Wars for what it is, and I think it's just as fun of a time as any of the others. Actually, while making this video, a demo for a brand new fan game was released, and I feel like I should mention it here. It's called Mega Man The Sequel Wars, and it's a fan-made sequel to the Wily Wars, recreating Mega Man 4 through 6 in the same vein as the first three, as well as some other brand new modes, and it isn't just a ROM hack either. It's a brand new Genesis game being built from the ground up and being released as a homebrew ROM. I played the demo myself during the making of this video, and it's already incredibly impressive, and I can't wait to see the full release. I've always wanted the rest of the NES games to be remade in the Wily Wars style, and now it's looking like we'll be getting just that, so definitely keep an eye out. I may sound like a broken record… again. But Mega Man 7 is yet another game in the series that didn't exactly get a fair shake. As the series went on, reaching now its seventh entry in a pretty short period of time, the original Mega Man formula started really getting stale for a lot of people, and when it came to classic Mega Man's first true outing on 16-bit hardware, literally over a year after Mega Man X came out for the same console, it's pretty obvious as to why Mega Man 7 wasn't super well received, much less cared about. It also happens to be my favorite game in the series. See, in hindsight, everything is different. Most Mega Man fans see the classic series and the X series for what they are, two different series that offer two different experiences. Sure, at their core, you're still jumping and shooting, but their level design and overall execution are inherently different. Nowadays, people tend to prefer one over the other, but at the time, Mega Man X was seen as the sequel, the thing that was supposed to leave the classic Mega Man formula behind. And even though both series ended up existing side by side, a lot of fans moved on from classic Mega Man. Mega Man 7 picks up six months after the events of Mega Man 6. Wily breaks out of jail and proceeds to wreak havoc with eight new robot masters and newest creations, Base and Treble, two robots meant to rival Mega Man and Rush. Taking a page from Mega Man X, Mega Man 7 now starts with an opening stage, meant to be both an easy tutorial stage as well as a short exposition dump setting up the premise of the game. And the theme song that plays for that opening stage is one of my favorite songs in the entire franchise. After you get through that first stage, things are mixed up just a little bit further this time around with only four Robot Masters being accessible from the start instead of the traditional eight. There are still eight Robot Masters, but the game starts you off with only four options. This could be seen as restricting, and I guess it kind of is, but at the time of release, it probably did help to streamline the whole figuring out the boss order thing. Mega Man 7's visuals are also my favorite of the entire franchise, even more so than X. Sure, Mega Man X looks great and has its own gritty tone to it, but after six games of Mega Man looking like this, Mega Man 7 is the first time the series really looks like how Mega Man is supposed to look. Mega Man actually looks like Mega Man, and not like some 8-bit I did my best approximation. The game overall is super vibrant and colorful, and the pixel art is all very detailed. But funny enough, this is a lot of people's problem with the game. A lot of people tend to complain about the size of the game's sprites, saying it's cramped and difficult to play because of the increased sprite size, but honestly, this was never a problem for me. The increased sprite size increases detail, overall increasing my immersion with the world I'm in, and considering the game was literally designed around those sprite sizes, I'm pretty sure it was all accounted for when the game was being made. I guess I understand some people's concern, but personally it was never a problem for me. This time around we also have a new, but not so new, power up in the form of the Rush Adapter, which can be obtained by finding and collecting the letters of Rush's name in the various stages. It's essentially the two Rush Adapters from Mega Man 6 combined into one. Only, this time around, an extra upgrade can be found that lets Mega Man fire his fist out as a homing attack, and just like Mega Man 6, once you get this power up, you aren't gonna want to use anything else. Also obtainable is Proto Man's Proto Shield. 
Throughout the game, Proto Man can be encountered in a few different hidden areas, giving Mega Man a piece of advice once you speak to him. The final encounter, though, he'll instead challenge you to a fight. If you can manage to defeat him and prove yourself, he'll hand over his Proto Shield. A very cool looking, but unfortunately useless item. It can be equipped to deflect projectiles, but unfortunately it can only be used alongside the standard Mega Buster. Now, I go through most Mega Man games using only the Buster anyway, and had this been included in a game that wasn't 6 or 7, I definitely would make full use of it, but unfortunately, with the inclusion of the Rush Adapter, it really makes absolutely no sense to equip the Proto Shield. Don't get me wrong, I love that this little side mission and item were included in the game, I just wish the Proto Shield had legitimate usefulness. Now admittedly, Mega Man 7 is a pretty paint by numbers entry. It didn't do much to differentiate itself from the games that came before it, and while at the time of release that was probably a huge problem, I think in modern day, looking back at the series as a whole, I think these games can be judged on an individual basis. I think Mega Man 7 has some really good level design, some of the best art direction in the entire series, has a lot of replayability since it's pretty packed with collectibles and different paths, and overall, it's just a very solid game. Sure, its level design may not be the most incredible of the series, but it's still very strong in my opinion, and in this case I actually do think the game's visuals pull its weight in a way that no other game in the series has. Mega Man 8 has gone down as sort of the black sheep of the franchise for whatever reason. I feel like in recent years, people have come around on it, but for a very long time, Mega Man 8 was seen by the majority of people as quote-unquote the bad one. I'm not sure how or when that reputation actually started, but from what I can tell, it seems like that opinion was based pretty much exclusively on the cutscenes, or more specifically, the voice acting for said cutscenes, in the North American version anyway. Mega Man 8 was released for both the original PlayStation as well as the Sega Saturn, and both being disc-based systems allowed Mega Man 8 to have fully animated FMV cutscenes. They basically play out as a short Mega Man anime that actually looks pretty good, all the characters look how they should, the backgrounds look good, and it's overall pretty high quality animation done by a studio called Zebek. The problem though, as I stated before, was the English dub. There's no dancing around this, it's bad. It's bad, and we all know it's bad. I don't know how any of these people got hired for the voice work because it all ranges from bad voice acting in terms of skill to bad voice acting in terms of literal speech impediments. If you've ever happened to hear someone say Dr. Wowie, this would be where that comes from. It's a shame because visually, all the cutscenes are good and I think having proper voice actors on these roles would have made them super enjoyable, but as they stand, they're… they're rough, man. Luckily though, the silver lining is that they happen to be bad enough to be entertaining and now have a comedic legacy. Unfortunately for the game itself, this caused a lot of people to think Mega Man 8 as a whole is bad, which it definitely isn't. It's not amazing, it's definitely lower mid for me, but the bar for Mega Man games being good happens to be extremely high. It's not really a series that tends to miss. Even at its worst, Mega Man is still good. Now, visually, Mega Man 8 looks good, it's very stylized, and while it's definitely not as striking and pleasing to me as Mega Man 7, it's still well done and works. The initial setup of the game is also similar to 7, with an intro stage and tackling the Robot Masters in 2 series of 4. I hadn't mentioned it while talking about 7, but 7 actually had a shop where you could buy various upgrades, most of which could be found throughout the game, but it did come in handy when you needed some extra E-Tanks. 8 differs from this by now having a shop with exclusive upgrades as opposed to consumable items. There are also various tweaks you can purchase with the bolts that are hidden throughout the stages. Some upgrades do things like allow you to climb and slide faster, while others can upgrade your buster with a new type of shot or cutting down the time it takes to charge. I won't go over every available upgrade, but Mega Man 8 has a lot of replay value for this feature alone. You can play the game over and over and kind of re-roll your skills each time to see what works best for you. You don't technically need any of them and you can raw dog most of the game standard buster only like any other Mega Man game, but the upgrade shop is a good way to switch things up without becoming overwhelming with JRPG level customizability. Now the stages are pretty lackluster in my opinion, like they're fine, don't get me wrong, they're by no means bad, but they're just very forgettable to me. While I haven't played this game in a while, I sometimes find it kind of hard to remember specific stage gimmicks or mechanics that make this game special. Well, other than the actual bad ones. See, Mega Man 8 has a couple segments in certain stages that are a real pain in the ass. There's the tedious flying sections that are basically a horizontal shoot 'em up, and of course, the infamous snowboard sections. I won't harp on it, but the words 
jump, jump, slide, slide, surely have been uttered in many a therapist's office. You basically need to quickly jump or slide whenever the game tells you to, and the margin for error is very large, as you typically only have a split second to react. I don't find these sections to be that bad now, but for new players especially, they're nothing short of frustrating. Mega Man 8 also isn't particularly difficult. Save for a couple of the bosses that have random spikes in difficulty, most of the game is actually kind of a cakewalk as far as Mega Man games go anyway. Even the Green Devil boss in this game, coming from a long lineage of wily devil bosses and should be one of the most fearsome encounters in the game, can be pretty easily beaten first or second try while barely taking a hit, if at all. The game's random difficulty spikes become glaringly obvious though, since probably due to the game being overall pretty easy, E-tanks were, for whatever reason, omitted in this one. You never really realize how important E-tanks are until the game just decides it isn't going to have them. So for the few bosses that you may have trouble with, your only option for regaining any lost health is by using two of the four Rush abilities. Throughout the game, you'll unlock four abilities for Rush that can be used once per life. There's a motorcycle that, while in use, negates damage, another one where Rush flies across the screen dropping bombs, and then the two that can refill your energy. Only problem is, only one of them is a surefire way to refill your health. One of them is Rush flying back and forth, dropping various health and weapon energy capsules, while the other operates kind of like Eddie from the previous games. He spawns and gives you one item. It can be a health item, like a health pellet, or weirdly enough, the Yasichi from Mega Man 1, or you can just get screwed and get some weapon energy you didn't need. Wonderful. Overall, I think Mega Man 8 is a good game that got a bad rap based on factors that didn't really reflect the quality of the game as a whole. Is it one of my favorite Mega Man games? No, not even close, and it's not one that I really revisit often either. Still though, it's a solid entry in the franchise and well worth your time if you've never played it before. Also, if you can manage to track down the Sega Saturn version, that one is actually the superior port in terms of content, as it adds two extra boss fights against both Woodman from Mega Man 2 and Cutman from Mega Man 1. And now that I've talked about 7 and 8, I feel like I should mention something else that's pretty cool. Now, this video is about mainline classic series entries, that's true, but much like in the case with the Wily Wars sequel I mentioned earlier, sometimes I feel it's important to mention fan games in certain instances, and this is one of them. One of the earliest Mega Man fan games I can remember are these two 8-bit demakes of both Mega Man 7 and 8. Unfortunately, not a ton of information is easily available about the creation of them, and they were actually made by a Japanese fan as Rockman 7 and 8 Famicom, respectively. It's exactly what it sounds like, and looks like. These games were brilliantly re-realized in an 8-bit style, and for the most part, it works flawlessly. You'd think because these games have totally different art styles and sprite sizes and proportions and everything, that maybe it wouldn't work so gracefully, but it honestly really, really does. Being released all the way back in 2008 and 2009 respectively, there's definitely some clunkiness to them in terms of using a controller and everything, so it's a shame that these games can't just be easily updated, but what's here is still totally playable, and they're designed incredibly well. I wouldn't be mentioning them if they felt like anything less than official, and if you're a Mega Man fan and have never given these a shot, you definitely need to. Early adoption wasn't really common back in the day. By the time the 90s rolled around, the idea of a video game console successor still wasn't something a lot of consumers were used to. Sure, plenty of people still wanted whatever the newest thing was, but most people weren't quick to just toss aside their investment, so companies would often still support and release games for their previous-gen consoles. So when Mega Man 8 dropped for a brand new next-gen platform from a brand new player in the hardware market with the Sony PlayStation, as well as Sega's ill-fated next-gen console, the Sega Saturn, they understandably didn't want to alienate their core fan base, who not only probably all still owned a Super Nintendo, but up until this point had been playing all previous Mega Man games on a Nintendo console. So Capcom decided to make a completely unique game specifically for the Super Nintendo, or rather, the Super Famicom, heavily using assets straight from Mega Man 8. This wasn't just a watered-down remix of 8, a la Castlevania Dracula X vs. Rondo of Blood, but rather a completely different game with, mostly, its own exclusive bosses, level design, and the most notable inclusion, a character choice of either Mega Man or base, each with their own unique properties. Mega Man has all his typical options, shooting left and right, charging, and sliding, but base's playstyle is very different. He can shoot in every direction except for down, at the expense of not being able to charge or shoot while walking. He has a double jump as well as a dash pretty much ripped straight from Mega Man X. Now, I have quite a weird history with this game. See, I've been playing it since around 1999, because as a kid, when I was just learning about emulation, I somehow, somewhere on the internet, stumbled upon this game called Mega Man and Base that didn't come out in America. I thought it was the absolute coolest thing. 
It was this elusive Mega Man game that we never got where you could play as base, and through the years, I thought very highly of this game, like the secret awesome Mega Man game that almost nobody I ever met knew about, much less played. As an adult, though, every Mega Man fan knows about this game, and I realized this game was not held in high regard by the fanbase. Frustrating level design, cheap enemy placement, unfair bosses, a ridiculously difficult endgame, and all made way harder if you decide to play as Mega Man. But I didn't know all of this when I was a kid. See, much like most nine-year-olds at the time, I f***ing was not good at video games, especially ones that are notoriously difficult for adults, and I couldn't beat any Mega Man game. So the increase in difficulty of Mega Man and base was completely lost on me. As an adult, and hearing about how much this game was actually despised and how it's seen as this black sheep of the series, I tried on multiple occasions to get through it, and every time I would play it, I'd get overwhelmed, frustrated, and tired, and eventually I'd quit before making it to the end game. Funny enough, where most people claim the most infuriating part of the game actually lies. I've even tried streaming it, thinking, surely committing to a stream of it would give me that push I needed to finally complete it, but that didn't stick either. Now, I always hear that Mega Man is essentially the hard mode of this game. The claim is that while he has an easier time against bosses, the level design is actually built around base's increased movement capabilities. Despite occasionally dabbling with base over the years, I always defaulted back to playing as Mega Man. So this time around, knowing I'd be making this video and knowing I couldn't give this game a fair shake without actually completing it for once, I played as base, and once again, I fell into the usual frustration hole. The truth of it is, a lot of the game, despite being irritating, isn't all that bad and is pretty doable, and aside from random spots of cheap bullshit, it really only gets frustrating during these random difficulty spikes, as seen with bosses like Burner Man who doesn't take increased damage from his weakness weapon if he gets damaged off screen, Dynamo Man who can heal himself, and the infamous King Fight boss rush which requires you to beat like 19,000 bosses in a row without getting a game over, and has a section that's made even more difficult when playing as Mega Man. Once I finally beat Wily on my last life with like one or two slivers of health left, I was exhausted. I didn't even feel accomplished necessarily, I was just aggravated. Relieved, but aggravated. The next day rolled around and for some reason, I had the urge to play it again. I don't know why. For some reason, I felt myself wanting to actually beat the game as Mega Man, which a day or so prior seemed borderline impossible, at least for me. Nevertheless, I booted the game up for another playthrough, and I ended up beating the game as Mega Man in less than half the time it took to complete his base. My brain could tell this run was technically harder, but for some reason it was way easier, and I had really no trouble with it despite wanting to rip my hair out the day before and I think I figured out the key to enjoying this game. For a long time, I thought Mega Man and Base was the one outlier in the series, the one classic Mega Man game that was actually not good. Credit where credit is due, still miles better than a lot of trash that was available back then, but still a weird stain on the series. But now, I don't think I really agree with that anymore. Mega Man and Base has a lot of bullshit in it, it does, and it's easily the most frustrating game of the entire series, but, and I hate that I have to say this, but uh, this is the kind of game where you need to, oh God, oh, it's common, G get good. <gasps> because I struggled so much during my base playthrough, I needed to learn the ins and outs of this game. I needed to master what the game was throwing at me to succeed. This isn't a game you can just fumble your way through. It demands a lot of the player and isn't very accepting of mistakes. Due to the fact that I had to really master the game to actually beat it, once the time came to do the Mega Man playthrough, I knew everything the game was going to throw at me, to the point where even though I was at a big disadvantage playing as Mega Man, it was all still doable. Not a cakewalk, mind you, but definitely not unreasonable by any means. I can't believe I'm saying this, but... I think I've actually come around on this game. It's never going to be my favorite, but I can confidently say that at this point in time, I like it. For everyone who has problems with this game, that's totally valid, and I get it. But for anyone who either wrote this game off or never played it before, I'd consider giving it another shot. If you persevere, you might end up liking it. And for God's sake, Use the shop system and buy the upgrades. It makes a world of difference. Literally without the upgrades from the shop, I'd say this game is probably a nightmare. But if you utilize the upgrades, not only does it make the game way more doable, but swapping upgrades on the fly actually adds a bit of extra strategy in as well. I don't think the game's that bad. After the release of Mega Man and Base, Capcom kind of started, well, 
all but completely ignoring classic Mega Man. The X series continued, and Mega Man would see some other spin-offs as well, but other than the one infamous GBA port we'll talk about in another video, classic Mega Man was nowhere to be found. I guess after literally nine games with very similar structure, the popularity of Mega Man Classic wasn't what it used to be, but I'm sure you can probably easily see these days, he still had a big, dedicated fan base. Well, 10 years went by and Capcom finally announced a brand new Mega Man game, but with a little bit of a weird twist to it. See, not only would this game not be developed solely in-house by Capcom, but rather co-developed with a studio called Inti Creates, who at this point, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, but instead of being some kind of logical next step in terms of graphics, Mega Man 9 would not only go back to the 8-bit style NES look of the original six games, but also take a step back in terms of mechanics. See, in an effort to make a Mega Man game in the vein of Mega Man 2, Mega Man 9 would strip Mega Man not only of his charge shot, but also his slide ability. This decision never really sat right with me, if I'm being honest. I get that they were trying to trim the fat and get back to the core of Mega Man gameplay and level design, but while there could have been an argument for the charge shot, I think the omission of the slide doesn't really do anything other than make the game feel more sluggish in comparison to the majority of the series. Still, the stages are designed around this and it's by no means a detriment. In fact, if you miss the charge and slide that much, there's actually an extra mode where you can play as Proto Man. These abilities are instead given to him, albeit at the cost of taking double damage and double recoil. He also has his Proto Shield, which can deflect projectile attacks while jumping. He was initially added as DLC for the original releases of the game on Xbox 360, PS3, and Wii, but nowadays he comes included with Mega Man 9 in the Mega Man Legacy Collection, although by needing to be unlocked first. It goes without saying that Proto Man is without a doubt the harder playthrough of the two, but the added mobility is highly rewarding for the trade-off of the game asking you to play a bit flawlessly. At this point, I don't even want to go over the story because it doesn't really matter where you are in the series. The stories are never really that fleshed out, and they often lean more into lightheartedness as opposed to the more serious tone of the X series. Don't get me wrong, Classic still has some moments where sh** gets real, but overall it's ultimately less of a focus. Still though, Mega Man 9's story sees a bunch of robots attacking the city, only this time, Wily gets on national television and frames Dr. Light, due to them actually being Dr. Light's robots. As it turns out, these robots were past their expiration date and in fear of being turned into scrap metal, joined Wily when offered a second chance at existence. The trade-off being that they'd be reprogrammed for Wily's use. It's a simple story, has a little bit of a different angle to it, but it's honestly nothing out of the ordinary. It's pretty textbook for the series, but honestly that's all it really needs to be. Now, the level design is honestly some of the best in the series. Mega Man 9 isn't some cheap nostalgia cash grab, I instead a love letter to what made the original NES Mega Man games great, and it's right up there with the best of the NES run. The art direction, while good, isn't quite up to par with something like Mega Man 5 or 6, but it's still vibrant and striking. It's still great in its own right, but I just don't think it quite reaches the highest peaks of the series. This is also the first time we get a woman robot master, so that's neato, even though all you need to do to beat her is stand in place and let bees attack her. The music is also a huge highlight. To be fair, they couldn't have really gotten away with making an NES-style Mega Man game without having the catchy melodies to back it up. And thank the Lord, Mega Man 9 doesn't disappoint. At all. Honestly, stage one of Wily's Fortress is so good that I straight up think it's a better track than the iconic Wily stage music from Mega Man 2 which itself is arguably the most recognizable song of the classic series. There's only so much I can go on about verbally in terms of the music, but just trust me when I say if you like Mega Man chiptune music, this stands right next to the best OSTs of the series. Oh, E-Tanks are back, thank God, and there's a shop now, which I think should be standard for any Mega Man game at this point. I think what stands out to me the most about this game isn't even how good the level design is itself, but all the stage gimmicks they managed to come up with this time around. It's not over the top or anything, but Mega Man 9 plays around with a lot of new stage mechanics that really change up how you traverse and interact with each stage. There's a lot of cool ideas in here that are pretty new concepts for the series. Mega Man 9 is an absolute shining example of how good this series can be. It's easily one of the best games in the series, and in an effort to follow in the footsteps of Mega Man 2, the developers didn't write any checks that they couldn't actually cash. I will admit, it's a little annoying losing the charge and slide, but it doesn't take too long to adjust to them being absent, although I will say, it's in my opinion a lot more enjoyable playing as Proto Man, despite being several times more frustrating. 
Well, about a year and a half later, they did it again. Mega Man 9 was pretty highly praised, so it makes sense that they would do a follow-up. But unfortunately, 10 kind of sits in a weird place in the series. With Mega Man 9, going back to the NES style for the ninth installment was kind of a novel idea. Sure, there was purpose to it, but it was definitely hinging on nostalgia a bit to draw people in. And this idea really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to carry on with in future sequels, in my opinion. But nevertheless, Mega Man 10 came out, and from what I've seen over the years, it isn't remembered as fondly as 9. It's by no means a bad game, great even, but in a lot of people's opinions, it unsurprisingly didn't quite measure up to 9. Personally, I remember actually liking Mega Man 10 a bit more the first time I played these two, but going back now, I can see where people are coming from. And though I think I do like 9 better, it's really not by much. 10 still has a lot going for it. This would be the first time Mega Man and Proto Man really team up as far as the story goes, and it's the first time you can choose to play as either one of them right from the start. They retain the same mechanics and abilities from 9, but this time around, there's a third option. Much like Proto Man in Mega Man 9, Base was included as DLC for 10, again being included as part of the Mega Man Legacy Collection 2, and since back in the day I never actually bought the DLC, I'm taking this opportunity to run through the game as Base, who has the same abilities from Mega Man and Base, save for the double jump ability. It's definitely missed, but I totally understand why it wasn't included. You can also use his buster to shoot off enemy shields as well as utilize trouble for assistance. Back to the main topic at hand though, Mega Man 10's story is, and you should be ready for this by now, nothing too involved. This time around, a bunch of robots come down with a virus called Roboenza and start attacking the city. Wily claims he was coming up with a cure, but his tools and lab equipment were stole by eight robot masters, so now it's up to Mega Man to defeat the eight robot masters and retrieve Wily's stuff, and shockingly to no one, Wily was actually behind the whole thing, go figure. Much like the previous game, the level design is really solid and, though slightly less memorable in terms of the stage gimmicks, there's nothing to scoff at. Just like Mega Man 9, 10 has plenty of new ideas that it plays with, and the music isn't slacking either. It's just as good as ever in terms of classic Mega Man. Mega Man 10 also has a difficulty mode, not something I would suggest or think is necessary for seasoned Mega Man players, but for newcomers who probably find this type of game intimidating, it's probably a good way to ease people in and show them the ropes. Selecting the easy difficulty covers up some spikes or bottomless pits and removes some enemies from the stage, but they didn't stop there. The game also includes a hard mode this time around, which adds enemies or makes existing enemies more tough to deal with. Both new difficulties affect the various boss attack patterns as well. Mega Man 10 also has some challenges and time attacks, and three secret robot master stages and weapons you can obtain. The time attack mode is hiding three Mega Man killers from the Game Boy games, which we'll talk about at a later date, and going through their levels and defeating them awards you three new weapons respectively, and these weapons can even be carried over into the main game. Other than that though, there isn't much else to really say about Mega Man 10. It's definitely not the most memorable of the series, but it's still a great game in its own right and just as fun as any of the others. It just doesn't do enough to particularly stand out on its own. That being said though, I still like it almost as much as 9, and the inclusion of base and the extra modes also give it not only some more variety, but a ton of replayability. Mega Man 10 is great, but I can definitely see why they didn't continue doing NES-style Mega Man games after this. Words can't really describe how excited I, and I would assume most of Mega Man's fanbase was when, after laying dormant for over seven years, a new entry in the series was announced. I don't really think any of us saw Mega Man 11 coming. Over the years, there had been a few cancellations of Mega Man-related projects, and as far as we all knew, a new entry in the classic series just didn't seem like it was in the cards. Probably the only thing that gave anyone any kind of hope was the fact that Mega Man was included in Smash for Wii U and 3DS back in 2014, but things still seemed very bleak. I mean, hell, Banjo was put in Smash Ultimate and the jury's still out on if we'll ever see another Banjo game despite the obvious want for it. Mega Man 11 was set to be a fully brand new mainline entry in the classic series, and not only would it be a brand new entry, but a brand new game in and of itself, not riding on the nostalgia of retro aesthetics or anything like that. This would be a brand new game with its own identity and its own ideas. Personally, I'd wish they had gone with a hand-drawn art style or something, something in the vein of what Mighty No. 9 was originally supposed to look like, but I was happy with the 2.5D cel-shaded look they decided to go with. 
It's maybe not quite as striking as a 2D hand-drawn style would have been, but it's by no means unimpressive, and I actually think it works really well. Due to the cell shading, I often forget that it's even 2.5D as opposed to regular 2D, which in my opinion, ends up being a good thing. A lot of times I tend to feel like 2.5D can look a bit tacky, but this game still managed to look bold and cartoony, which I feel is a big element of the classic series as a whole. Now, despite all being structurally very similar, most Mega Man Classic games bring some kind of new element or gimmick to the table that sets it apart from the others, and in Mega Man 11, it's the new Double Gear system. This game actually has a bigger story element than most in the series, giving us some real backstory about the pasts of both Dr. Wily and Dr. Light. We see them back in their days at university, back when a rift was first made between the two doctors, who up until this point were not only colleagues but close friends. Light had been researching and experimenting with the concept of robots having independent thought, and Wily had come up with something he called the Double Gear System. Implementing this invention into any robot would give said robot immense strength or speed, making them far more useful than they would have otherwise been. However, this was not only a dangerous concept, but would over time damage the robots equipped with it. Because only one of the doctors would receive funding and the green light to proceed with their research, they both pled their cases and unfortunately for Wily, they sided in favor of Dr. Light, and Wily's research was put to an end. This is what caused the initial fight between the two doctors and set Wily on the evil path we've seen him on throughout the series. Now in present day, Wily wakes up in the middle of the night and remembers his double gear system, which I do think is a bit of a weird inconsistency narratively, because how could he possibly ever forget? Anyway, he decides this will be his new scheme to finally take down Light and Mega Man. Now, all of this exposition was necessary to explain Mega Man 11's main mechanic this time around, the aforementioned double gear system. With the push of a button, you can either speed Mega Man up, which in this game results in everything around you being slowed down, or increase Mega Man's offensive power, which when used with Robot Master weapons, actually changes their attacks entirely. Truth be told, you can run through the game and never touch it. It's all doable without the double gear system, but I will say, in certain parts of the game, you can definitely tell it was designed around the use of the double gear, especially the speed gear, but much like doing a buster only run, you can implement some self-imposed difficulty if you want. Back in Mega Man 11 is the shop, which not only lets you stock up on consumables like E-Tanks and Lives with bolts you collect in the stages, but also has permanent power-ups as well. This is once again something absolutely not necessary to complete the game, but it will definitely make your life a hell of a lot easier, especially on your first run. I'm not gonna lie, Mega Man 11 is a pretty frustrating f***ing game. I'm not even gonna dance around it. Don't get me wrong, it's all doable, but I do notice some cheap enemy placement and some pretty cheap ways to die that I feel like are probably supposed to be mitigated by the double gear system. But honestly, using the double gear system is never my first instinct, and this is something I've always felt about this game, and it's now even more solidified after playing all these games one after the other. This is made even more frustrating by the fact that these stages are long, tiringly long. The level design is good, but most stages tend to overstay their welcome a bit, and coupled with the fact that there aren't many stage checkpoints to compensate, and that you only start off with three lives, most players will probably need to replay stages over and over and over till they're mastered to have an actual chance to learn the patterns of whatever boss lies at the end. I don't necessarily mind stages being long as a concept, but they should really start you off with at least one extra life to compensate. This can be mitigated by buying more lives in the shop, but that's not something I typically like doing, as it makes me feel like I'm cheapening the difficulty. Also, the lack of checkpoints means you can get super far in a stage, die, and then get sent right back to the beginning of the stage. Now you're at the very start of the stage without a full stock of lives, at which point just letting yourself game over makes more sense than trying to keep going. All that being said though, despite some frustration with the game in terms of its difficulty, Mega Man 11 is still very well designed and fun. It looks good, the music, while not quite hitting the highs of some of the catchy tunes of the rest of the series, is still very good with some standout tracks that should still get stuck in your head. The voice acting and story is charming and fun, and overall it's just a very good Mega Man game. I hesitate to call it one of the best, especially because of the high bars this series is constantly setting, but it's a very solid Mega Man game, and after seeing nothing for like eight years, a really good entry is really all we could have asked for in the end. I'd rather a series stick to what it knows and release something familiar that's of quality with some modern bells and whistles, rather than stray too far and lose the audience it gained in the first place. Mega Man 11 is great and worthy of its title. Just wish there was an option to play as extra characters like Proto Man, though. 
The Mega Man Classic series is very near and dear to me. It's been with me as long as video games themselves have. I've never known video games without knowing Mega Man, and it's a franchise that, despite sometimes being left out in the cold, has delivered nothing but quality experiences time and time and time again. And it's pretty unique because if you talk to most fans, everyone seems to have their own favorite game. There's definitely some bias with some people who prefer Mega Man 2 and swear it's never been topped, but the mass majority of Mega Man fans all seem to have their own reasons for favoring any one of these games. With 12 games to choose from, there's no real duds in the series. It's no wonder each one can be especially significant to different people. Even at its quote-unquote worst, with Mega Man and Base, a game that was essentially a stopgap for people who didn't have a PlayStation or Sega Saturn, even that game, as misunderstood as I now think it is, is still, at worst, a good game. Sure, in the context of the entire series, I can see how some people think it's a bad Mega Man game, but when compared to what was available in this genre in the 90s, I've always been hard-pressed to call it a bad video game. When you have 12 mainline games and the worst game in your franchise is still a pretty good game, you've clearly got a good series on your hands. Most series don't receive this many entries, and every time we think Mega Man has been put out to pasture, we get surprised when we least expect it by another really good game. Who knows if and when we'll see another Mega Man Classic game. It's never really a surefire thing, but I know if and when we get a Mega Man 12, it'll at the very least be just as good as anything we've seen in the series. Until then, I implore you to check out Mega Man Maker if you haven't. It's a fan-made game in the vein of Mario Maker, only for Mega Man. It's honestly right up to par with something like Mario Maker. It's one of the best fan games I've ever played, and because of the dedicated fan base of this series, it's ever expanding. So if you made it this far in the video, your next stop should be the endless blue bomber fun that that game has to offer. As for me, I'll be doing the same, as well as checking out any new fan games that come down the pipeline, as when Capcom isn't currently making Mega Man games, the fans always are, and much like the official games, they're consistently good. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you liked it and want to see more, there's a couple other videos right there you can check out. And if you want to see everything I upload, subscribe and then tap the bell icon. And if you want to help support the channel, I also got a Patreon. I flubbed that line and I'm keeping it in.